a very good afternoon to one and all uh, on behalf of iip digital team i dr utra mohan welcome you to this webinar on injuries of shoulder and its rehabilitation the speakers for today are dr kanika taneja and dr ashish acharya uh, the moderator for today is dr shivani kaul this webinar is being organized by delhi iip central delhi district team uh, we are streaming live on iip india youtube channel i request all to subscribe to the youtube channel to get regular notification during our webinars i welcome all participants to this session and now i request dr shivani to please take over thank you dr utra greetings to one and all it gives me and dr shell the moderators for today's session immense warmth and great pleasure grace all of your presence in the interest of the entire physiotherapy community on behalf of iip team of central delhi district it gives me tremendous contentment to welcome all budding physios fellow colleagues seniors and esteemed speaker speakers for today's webinar on injuries of shoulder and its rehabilitation before we begin this webinar i would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the members of central delhi iip team and iip team india who sincerely committed to this webinar to make it a success this webinar would have not been possible without the support of each and every one present here the webinar scheduled today shall brush upon a spectrum of exciting and benefiting themes that discusses injuries of shoulder and its rehabilitation i am sure that the audience shall gain insight and information that would remain effective in their life exercises and work to proceed further i hereby request dr ashish acharya who is sports medicine consultant at sir gangaram hospital new delhi to throw some light on today's topic sir is a qualified ms orthopedic with super specialty in sports medicine from germany he has done intense work in area of sports medicine from germany and has an intense work in the area of sports medicine and has many publications to his credit his quest for knowledge has led him to be part of many academic talks previously as resource person i am sure our today's session with him is definitely going to be par excellence sir we request you to please start the session good afternoon everyone uh thank you the organizers can you see my screen uh dr kanika dr shivani can you see my screen yes sir it's well visible uh yes sir you're visible we can see your screen yeah uh thank you so much organizers for inviting me to this august gathering so now today we are as you had already explained we are uh, talking about shoulder pain and injuries around shoulder i am dr ashish acharya from gangaram hospital just yeah shoulder pain it can happen in 55% of the patients having throwing or upper limb sports whereas 20% of all the patients in all the sports almost 25% of the opd normal orthopedic opd come with the shoulder pain it can arise uh because of so many variety of reasons either it is arising from the shoulder or maybe a referred pain like from the neck elbow wrist or liver diaphragm can also present as shoulder pain even the cardiac causes also present as a shoulder pain arising from the shoulder it may be a non traumatic or a traumatic one in non traumatic it may be inflammatory infective metabolic malignancy or degenerative in non traumatic it may be acute or chronic overuse like the rotator cuff group the instability the acj the degenerative groups coming to the most common thing that we see in our regular common clinical practice the adhesive capsulitis it patients usually presents with pain and reduced range of motion it may be primary with no obvious cause or may be secondary because of so many causes like traumatic any injury or post operative or stiffness or infective like tb or bacterial or inflammatory like uh, subacromial bursitis or impingement or ankylosing spondylitis degenerative metabolic malignancy and neurological causes like parkinsonism and stroke or syringomyelia patients present with usually pain 
in one side of the shoulder may be bilateral in 30% of patients, usually women and of the age of around 40. Difficulty in putting on the clothes, making of hair, ladies reaching on their back would be difficult. So this is the most common complaints that they will present, which will give you an idea of having stiffness. There is a dull ache in the shoulder, arm or neck, worst at night, inability to lie on that shoulder and any certain movement to any certain attempt to move the shoulder will cause a severe pain. Clinical presentation would be like, they would be complaining of ki teen se char mahine, che mahine, it's like five months to three years of pain, usually complaints of neck or even back pain. Patients coming with neck pain, you must always examine the shoulder. There is a reduced range of motion, both active and passive. Most commonly rotations are restricted. Generalized tenderness of the shoulder and resting of the muscles are present. X-rays are usually normal. In investigation, there is a reduced, in MRI, uh, there is a reduced joint space, axillary pouch is reduced, and there is a proximal migration of the head. But again, adhesive capsulitis is mostly a clinical diagnosis. Management, in the first line, it is always anti-inflammatories and physiotherapy, exercises, stretching exercises. I think Kanika would be dealing with that. Uh, if it is not getting relieved, then we are going for a local steroid injection or a nerve block. And then again, going for the physical exercises and stretching and strengthening of the periscapular muscles that will increase the range of motion. If there is no progress in range of motion or there is a persistent pain, then we need to intervene. Intervene in the sense we need to go in and surgically cut all the adhesion, surgical release of the capsule. As you can see here, we are moving, removing all the adhesions around the shoulder that will increase the range of motion of the patient post-operative. But again, post-op rehab is very, very required. Even on the day of surgery, patient needs to go on a rehab on, on the evening on the day of the surgery to get good result. This is six weeks down the line, patient has got complete range of motion. Coming to the chronic overuse group, the rotator cuff group, where we see impingement, rotator cuff tear, whether it is partial or complete, the instability group, the recurrent instability or multidirectional instability, or the degenerative group, where there is, is uh, acromial spur or glenohumeral osteoarthritis. The rotator cuff tear, if it is partial, usually comes for the young patients at the age of 40 or 45, uh, vague pain on lifting of the arm or overhead or throwing fatigue or weakness in overhead activities. Uh, usually difficult to diagnose these patients here usually occurs within the tendon and may communicate with subacromial or splenohumeral joint. If you can see in MRI, we can see there is a partial, either it is an articular surface tear or the bursal surface tear or there may be an intratendinous tear the tear that extends intratendinously but do not communicate with either the bursal or the articular surface. Ultrasound can give us good results uh, in diagnosing rotator cuff tears, but MRI or MR arthrogram are the investigation of choice. Treatment, conservative, again, in a partial tear, we usually, most of the patients, they are treated conservatively with activity modification, NSAIDs and physical therapy with the strengthening of periscapular exercises and strengthening uh, of the rotator cuff uh, muscles. Only very few mus uh, patients which have a uh, tear extending beyond 50% of the tendon requires an arthroscopic repair. In that, we go in we take bites from the cuff. As you can see here, this is the cuff tear margin. And once we pull it, it is coming back to its original position and we tie it down. And our whole cuff, soft spongy cuff is restored back to its original position. In a full thickness tear, there is mostly a history of an injury or a fall pain on the lateral aspect of the shoulder, 
there is inability to lift the shoulder or hand there is a light pain or crepitus or crackling sensation on examination there is atrophy of the musculature particularly supraspinatus and infraspinatus both are hugely atrophied in comparison to the other side and there is a drop arm sign if you would see the patient is not able to lift the arm now and even if we lift it it is not she is not able to bring it back without support so that is the drop arm sign the investigation again x ray would be normal mri is the investigation of choice even ultrasound a good ultrasound uh, in the hands of a good ultrasonologist ultrasound can also give good results you can see the muscles a complete tear with retraction of the muscles here in a rotator in an mri an mri of the treatment again in a complete rotator cuff tear rest activity modification little bit of uh, anti inflammatories will do no role of any steroid injections and uh, any complete rotator cuff tear means she or he has to go for a arthroscopic rotator cuff repair whether it is an arthroscopic repair whether it is a mini open repair or a open repair whatever you are well versed with as you can see here this is the glenohumeral part this is the biceps this is the torn margin we are removing the bursa very soon you will see this is the cuff margin which is torn as you can see here this is the torn cuff margin we are putting in the anchors i won't go into detail of this procedure and once we do that we then tie the knot and put it back our original cuff soft spongy cuff is back to the footprint again post op rehab is a major thing here beyond after surgery we need to go for a rehabilitation a good physio a good rehab and and a group rehab protocol has to be followed by all the patients whether it is a partial rotator cuff tear or a complete rotator cuff tear or a bankart lesion or even a this capsulitis a post op rehab is a must a good post op rehab gives very good results coming to slap tear now what is a slap tear it is a superior labral anterior and posterior tear there are so many types of it this is a snider classification mafe has increase this classification to type 5 6 and 7 biceps is usually inserted 5 mm posterior to the superior glenoid and usually to the posterior superior part of the labrum slap tear usually happens with an outstretched hand if you fall on an outstretched hand or a tight capsule or a sudden force of abduction and external rotation then you are most likely to tear off your biceps anchor there is an anterior shoulder pain there is a clicking or popping sound patients will complain of decreased power or velocity of throw even a normal person they won't be able to throw a ball in a cricket match because of a slap tear o'brien and speed tests confirms your diagnosis mri actually authenticate that you are dealing with a slap tear or a biceps anchor tear you go for a slap repair in a young patient with a dominant arm pain and a history of trauma with a positive o'brien test and an mri indicative supporting your diagnosis so planning for a slap tear here i would just let you see how the slap tear you seen this is the biceps anchor going on and here is the torn part now we'll bring in the shaver to prepare the base here is our biceps at the behind at uh, the back of our scene then we put in our anchor i'll just go through rapidly through this video the anchor is going in and once the anchor is there then we take bite through the biceps and you can see so nicely the biceps is anchored back to the original position in the glenoid as you can see here here is our biceps it is anchored back to the glenoid this is the glenoid surface
Now coming to the instability group. According to the etiology, there is a, so many classifications according to etiology, if it is bony or cartilaginous, whether the defect is in glenoid or the humeral head or the labrum, if it is capsular ligamentous means if there is laxity or in muscular where it is dynamic, uh, if the muscles are uh, torn like a rotator, massive rotator of tears leads to instability of the joint. Mechanism of injury, if it is atraumatic like in hyperlaxity syndrome, alert analyst syndrome, glenohumeral hypoplasia, neuromuscular disorders or in traumatic cases, in an acute case or micro trauma, repetitive micro trauma cases. Direction of the dislocation, it is anterior, posterior, inferior or superior, or it is multidirectional in cases of alert down loss and uh, atraumatic cases. Degree of loss of contact, either it may be a subluxation or a complete dislocation. It may be acute, chronic or recurrent, recurrent where the patient has a multiple episodes of subluxation or dislocation. Patients usually present with pain or there may be a frank history of recurrence dislocation or the patient may, become, may come to you with a dislocation which you need to reduce. A young man, a young or a pain, clicking, difficulty in moving, weakness, loss of function are the usual presentations for a patient coming to the OPD. Appearance and test is usually positive. The humeral translation or draw tests are positive. MRI authenticating your diagnosis with the labrum tear. Here we can see the labrum all torn. In case of a bony lesion where there is a bone loss, scapula, here is the glenoid, the bone loss is there. So the procedure will be different in case of a bone loss exceeding 20% of the total glenoid. The treatment in case of an index dislocation, usually you, or the first dislocation, you need to go for a rehab only, slim pain relief and immobilization, and then slowly mobilization and strengthening exercises. If the patient has recurrence, then and only then we are going for a treatment. Depending on the type of the instability, if it is an atraumatic one, then conservative is the mainstay of our treatment. Rehab, strengthening of our rotator cuff, Periscapular exercises, uh, scapular rhythm, biofeedback, counseling. This is the mainstay of the treatment. But if the patient is persistent problem, then we go for a capsular shift and tightening procedures or maybe other bony procedures that we will discuss. Uh, no need to discuss it here. In the case of a traumatic instability, surgical repair or Bancard's repair can be considered. I'm not going to, I just show you how the labrum tear looks inside the joint. This is our labrum, which is torn. I'll just change the view to show you how it is seen from the other angle. So you can be here. This is the labrum, this is the humeral head. This is our labrum, which is torn. This is the glenoid actually. This is our labrum, which is torn. The whole of the labrum, and we need to put it back there. Here, after repair, all our labrum is back, nice and tight, and our repair is strong. So coming to the degenerative group, usually age of the patients are more than 40. There is a dull continuous pain. There might be crepitus, there may be stiffness, inability to perform their daily routine activities. And on examination, there's a generalized tenderness, restricted range of motion, on X-ray, you can see osteophytes, decreased range of motion in an MRI. There is a loss of cartilage here. The osteophytes are definitely seen. Decreased joint space. Coming to the management, usually it is conservative. Physical therapy, anti-inflammatory, modification of lifestyle. If not relieved, go for, we can go for a local injection of steroid. Still not go patient has persistent pain, then we can go for an arthroplasty or total shoulder replacement. So here, this you, you can see here how bad the shoulder is. So we are removing the shoulder and putting in the new shoulder. This is what the post of X-ray would look like. Now, acromial spur present as a 
pain in the overhead abduction usually all signs of impingement are positive here with the painful off syndrome uh, there is a tenderness over the acromial process range of motion is painful and restricted on an x ray you can see the acromial spur here decreasing the humeral acromial distance and thus impinging over the rotator cuff the patients if ignored can present with complete or partial rotator cuff tears so if you can if you are seeing this then we must go for a uh, with such a big of such a big acromial spur subacromial decompression is definitely warranted in other cases conservative like rest activity modification nsets and strengthening exercises obviously kanika will deal with that and if not uh, then second line will be steroid if still persistent then we will go for surgical decompression in acromial decompression we remove that spur with our bird and the acromial distance is increased thank you so much for your patient sharing thank you Uh, thank you so much, sir. Your uh, presentation was definitely very simple but elaborate, and I am definitely sure that our audience has definitely got benefited out of it. Uh, so we we would give uh, two minutes for to the audience if they have any queries. So before audiences uh, put up uh, their query, I had a query. There are few patients who are wary of going for a shoulder surgery. So yeah. what could be the consequences of avoiding these shoulder surgeries? No, there are definitive diagnoses. There are definitive conditions where you should not avoid a shoulder surgery. It's, it's, it all depends on how you counsel the patient. Like adhesive capsulitis, the patient can be conservatively managed. If they are uh, not interested, we can go for proper physical therapy. Although the physical therapy will be a prolonged one, then a steroid injection or a repeat steroid injection, and again physical therapy and range of motion exercises, stretching and strengthening, that will do the work. But in case of a complete rotator cuff tear, in case of partial rotator cuff tears, also we can always almost ninety percent patients they uh, quite well recover with conservative treatment with strengthening exercises. And uh, periscapular and shoulder exercises, they recover quite well. But in case of a complete rotator cuff tear, in case of a recurrent dislocation, we should not. Perhaps it's it all depends on how you counsel the patient. The patient should be told that if you wait or if you are going to prolong your surgery, then the results will be unpredicted or perhaps worse. And even after surgery, the condition may not improve. But if you are going for surgery now, the conditions will definitely improve as the results are predicted. So it's all depend how you make the patient know about the condition which he or she is in between. Complete rotator cuff tear. You are not supposed to keep the patient for conservative treatment under no circumstances. And in case of a recurrent dislocation, unless and until it is an atraumatic one or it goes to any of the group like Ehlers Danlos or the hyperlaxity syndromes. They should be get. They should get themselves treated, operated. Right, sir. Sir, is there any correlation between old age arthritis and any uh, shoulder surgery in young age? Not exactly. Not exactly, because as you have seen, there is when we go in, we don't usually touch. Uh, very there, there is no clinically proven that if any shoulder surgery is done, means arthroscopic, these soft tissue surgeries. But I'm talking. If you are going for shoulder surgeries for fractures or anything, uh, which involves the joint, if the joint is fractured or anything, then that might be a cause for early arthritis. Otherwise, with the shoulder surgeries, I don't think there is any correlation with between uh, bankart repair or a rotator cuff repair, and you are getting arthritis at uh, early age. No, you can still lead a normal life, normal arthritis at the age of sixty as expected. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your time and invaluable knowledge. I'm sure we are going to always have your support for our uh, future endeavors as well. Thank you thank so you. much, sir. Sure. Uh, taking the lead forward, I now welcome and request Dr. Kanika Taneja, sports physiotherapist from Sai New Delhi, to abreast us with the rehabilitation aspect of shoulder injuries. Ma'am has been rank holder during her UG and PG studies at Jamia Hamdard. 
She is currently pursuing her PhD from her, her alma mater itself, and in past has been associated with Maharaja Agassiz Hospital and Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. With her amassed experience, I can assure everyone that this session shall be the most uh, interesting and enriching one. Ma'am, I hand over you the screen. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I first of all thank you all for giving me this platform and an opportunity to share my knowledge with all of you. I hope uh, it will be beneficial for all of you. So I'll just begin without wasting much of your time. Begin with sharing my screen. Yeah, can you all uh, see my screen? Uh, yeah, ma'am, it's visible. Okay. So as Dr. Ashish has elaborately explained everything about the shoulder injuries, I'll just take over from there and try to explain about the rehabilitation part. And uh, I am just trying to give the knowledge of current things, whatever the new things that have come up and improve, how can we improve our rehab techniques? So I'll just try to add on to that. Uh, we've already discussed what is tendonitis syndrome, the painful arc syndrome, uh, impingement, uh, anatomy, sir, has explained it very nicely. So I'll just rush through. These are the basic vectors that play uh, between the shoulder joints, the deltoid vector and our sits vector, which allow the movements of the shoulder joint. As you know, it's a very complex and highly mobile joint. So the dynamic stability and the static stability is very important. And the main leaders for that is just the musculature of the shoulder joint. So these are our major muscles, the sits, as we call it, uh, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. And then we should not miss, the most of the time we tend to miss the periscapular muscle because they are very important as they hold the scapula along the thoracic cage and give the overhead actions. So we should not miss the trapezius, serratus anterior and the deltoid. They have their own specific roles at own specific ranges to provide a complex and a dynamic and a strong shoulder. Uh, again, showing the vector depictions, the translatory component and the rotatory components worked hand in hand to give the compression force as well as the rotatory force of the glenoid in the labrum. Then with the diseases, I think I'll just rush through it because we've already discussed there is group one, two and three. And depending on the severity, we have the treatment defined. So just with group one, when there is a chronic and it's in an elderly, then the conservative management is preferred. And when we go up to group two, when there's a tear, I think we should, we should completely then depend on the surgeon to go for the as early as a possible surgical repair. And then we can have a better rehab. And thirdly, with group three, where there are tendinopathies, partial thickness tears, and we should, uh, there is a kind of prolonged conservative treatment. So we should not get impatient and we should continue with the conservative treatment because it could be tend to prolong to give us the results. So shoulder, what are the types of shoulder? Well, there, are, there aren't any types of shoulder. I just want to tell you about the surfers, a thrower and a swimmer. So these are three terms which are used in the sports arena. It's like surfer's shoulder, thrower's shoulder and swimmer's shoulder. And there are differences in between them. So with the surfer's shoulder, it is characterized by the deficiency of external rotation. Whereas a thrower shoulder is characterized by internal rotation deficient. So we should assess it nicely to see where the things are lacking. Then only we can plan an appropriate physiotherapy or a rehabilitation program. So that is why I'm just trying to tell you these terms. And with the surfer, something interesting just to add to your knowledge. For the first time ever, see Olympics started in almost 8th century BC. But for the first time ever in this year, 2021, if the pandemic allows, the Olympics are going to held and surfing will be a debutant sport in it. 
So there are many injuries related to surfing, throwing and swimming. And then depending on what is deficient, we should plan a rehab protocol. Uh, for me, just to keep it simple, in the context of uncertainty, my approach is you should just exclude things. So one, we should exclude the cervical spine. Two, we should exclude the shoulder pain with restriction greater than 45 degrees and later rotation is also affected. And three, we have to be very cautious with instabilities. As Sir has explained about the instability also, they could be traumatic and traumatic. So these three things we should first exclude and then we can define a rehab protocol. Now, why rehab? Well, as you can see in the image itself, we're just trying to fix the shoulder with the hammer, but we don't do it with the hammer. We do it with our brain and our skills. So why rehab? I think everyone knows. So to provide effective and appropriate exercise protocol. One, to prevent it. And two, if it has already occurred, to take care of it. So injury prevention is also a role and injury rehab or treatment is also a role. And as uh, Ashish sir has told us about the arthroscopical repairs, in that context, our knowledge about the musculature is very important. And our rehab goal is very important because we should facilitate the recovery by providing minimal strain on the specific helix structure. Whatever has been operative should be given relative rest and rest other of the ligaments or the muscles could be strained upon. And definitely for any or every post-surgical, the orthopedic surgeon is what we have to follow to and we should and that they are the better judge or the best judge, maybe not the better judge, about what they have fixed, what ligament repair they have used or what any uh, transplant or anything that they have used. So we should follow their judgments about how long should we wait to add on to weights and other things. And definitely last thing about the rehab is we should correct the biomechanics, the kinematics and the firing patterns of the muscles. Uh, this is just a slide to tell you about the rotator cuff pain patterns, about which muscle can lead to pain to which specific areas like supraspinatus going more to the anterolateral, infraspinatus to more to the anterior and specific to the lateral, subscapularis is going to more to posterior components and the teres minor is just limited to above elbow. And because these are the pain patterns, there are areas of trigger points in these specific areas which leads to these pain patterns. Next, uh, uh, Dr. Ashish has uh, explained about the test. So these are the common tests which we need to do, empty can, rotator cuff, impingements, lift off test, and for infraspinators, the lag side is seen. Uh, this is what the functional assessment is. I think uh, this is something which we lack. We should, on the day one of other patient to our visit, we should do this assessment and at the day of discharge, we should do it to just to review how the scores have improved. So there's a DASH questionnaire, there's a shoulder pain and disability index, there's an American shoulder and elbow surgeon score, there's a specific score given to the ADLs, given to the pain movements, and then according to that, that score should improve at the end of our rehab protocols. Now the management most of the time in the acute phase go up to price. I will not be discussing any day by day management or any specific protocol. I'll just give you the knowledge about what should be done and how it should be done. Then you can probably fix up those things according to the patient you see. I don't know what kind of patient you'll be attending, but I will give you a broad conceptual things about, about what is to be done and when it is to be done. So this is a basic protocol that works. We need to go for an absolute or a relative rest depending. The cryotherapy works initially. We've got whole lots of modalities, IFT, US, laser to reduce the inflammatory processes. Then with the exercise part, we should restore the range of motion. And definitely normalization of strength and dynamic muscle balance. Proprioception and dynamic joint stabilization is often missed with shoulder joint. So that should be our part of our goal. 
So this is how a rehab things works. Less use of passive modalities and more use of active things like ROM, stretching, strengthening, aerobic exercises, and finally sending the player back to the sport. Or if it's a layman, then sending the person back to their functional movements. So uh, first of all, the protective position. If you see any patient with the shoulder pain, you should tell them that this is a specific protective position so that the pain doesn't aggravate. So it's like lying on the other shoulder, non-painful shoulder, and you use a pillow to support your arm to reduce the rotator cuff pain at night. Uh, these are simple stick exercises, pendulum exercises for range of motion, and it gives the stretching as well along with it. Now, it, it's, it's just a humor added to it. What's your one, one person asking the other, what's your favorite exercise? And the other one says chewing. So we have to put in the efforts. It's not, it's not that things will come to you. You have to work up to things. So with the exercise, two rules are important. It should be progressive because unless and until you overload a muscle or you try to progress, you will not attain your goals. Second, you should get it right. You should assess which specific muscle is weak, what is your goal, which specific target muscle or movement you have to improve upon. So that will happen only if you prepare your goals. Now, beginning with rotator cuff strengthenings. So first, strengthening the supraspinatus. The conventional things everyone keeps telling, pendulum ka lena, haat niche latka ke karo, fir usme weight dal ke karo and then just trying to move your hand up and down along with the weight. These are conventional things. But the current study says for supraspinatus to work, you need to have a full can, empty can, or a prone full can exercise. These are the three basic exercises which improves the supraspinatus strength. And among these three, the full can exercise is the best exercise. Through this uh, webinar, I'll just try to tell you the best of all according to the researches being held so that you can implement that. So why the full can is a best exercise? Because it minimizes the disadvantageous shear force of deltoid and it removes the disadvantage of internal rotation. So that is why a full can exercise for supraspinatus strengthening is a best of all rehabilitation exercises. You can see that in the figure as well. Next, about the infraspinatus, we know it's a main external rotator. And then with the infraspinatus, we have been doing upper external rotations and external rotations in the neutral range. We keep teaching them with the TheraBand and just try to change the colors of TheraBand to increase the intensity and being progressive. So for that, and there is a teres minor, which is also an external rotator with transverse abduction and extension. It also reinforces the shoulder capsule. Now strengthening the teres minor, we uh, keep telling the horizontal abduction and lying external rotation. As you can see in the image, the person is lying on side lying and try to do external rotation with the weights and then with the horizontal abductions. These are all conventional things. Now to go up to the new things for infraspinatus and teres minor, just look at the left side image and you can see there's a towel roll placed in between and you have to use the counter action force. So you just try to do the isometric of this uh, pressing the towel roll and along with that, you have to do your external rotation. This specific exercise has given almost maximum voluntary isometric contraction of up to 62% for your infraspinatus and your teres. And along with this new, the other exercises is standing external rotation and 45 degrees of abduction, which gives MBIC of almost 53% and prone external rotation and 90 degree of abduction, as you can see in the image. So the conventional thing should be now forgotten and we should shift to current new concepts and just add on to these rehab exercises to have the benefits in less time. 
with the sub, uh, subscapularis, we know it's a major internal rotator. It tries to pull the humerus and helps the prevention of displace, displacement. Now with the subscapularis, the internal rotation or the internal external rotation stretch is what is conventionally being done. But the current study says that doing a diagonal exercise is the best of all to strengthen the subscapularis. So conventional was just IR internal rotation, 90 degree abduction. But now you have to add on to the diagonal component. This is what the diagonal component is. Diagonal exercise for subscapularis. You begin with shoulder rotated, external 90 degree abduction and just try to do it in the coronal plane. So this is like similar to a tennis swing. This as in provides more physiological parameters to your subscapularis and give the better strengthening than our conventional tra traditional things. Now, regarding the periscapular muscle, the deltoid is very important. Our old training used to say, just do the shoulder abduction. Deltoid side se uthata hai ji, shoulder abduction karaye in the frontal plane. But no, the newer studies, the researchers says that you have to do it in scapular plane. So with, when you do it in scapular plane, the scapular abduction, the humeral head is stabilized. And then it gives a better movement, a better strength of the deltoid muscle. With the trapezius strengthening, we have been knowing that bilateral external rotation for infraspinatus and lower trapezius involves, like you're just trying to do this action by holding a tubing with both hands and externally rotated. So now the trapezius has got three specific parts we should focus on each one of them. We should not miss any of the fibers. So UT is upper trapezius, upper fibers of trapezius, middle fibers of trapezius, and lower fibers of trapezius. Behind, below the each box, I've given the figure of each specific exercise, which according to the current concept is the best and inculcates the maximum voluntary isometric contractions. So for the upper trapezius, as you can see in the image, there's an abduction 90 degree in the scapular plane, and then you try to do the external rotators. Then with the middle fiber of trapezius, you have to do the prone rowing. It's a unilateral prone rowing. You're just trying to move anti-gravity, and then only you can just inculcating all your middle fibers. Then with the lower fibers of trapezius, prone overhead raise. As you can see, there's a stick in the hand. You can do it to start with, you can do it without the weights, and then you can add on to stick, and then maybe therabands, and then dumbbells or kettlebells, depending on how the patient is progressing. So we should consider all the fibers of trapezius and then strengthen the holistic trapezius muscle. So uh, scapular thoracic strengthening is what most of the time makes missed out. So with the scapular thoracic, I've explained the trapezius, serratus anterior, all these muscles are very important and a push-up exercise. Push-up can have whole lots of variation depending what is the capability of the patient. So you can just start with knee push-ups initially or maybe wall push-ups. It's more easier than the knee even. And then gradually build up to whole lots of push-ups. I'll, I'll show you the image of push-up. Uh, we should not miss the scapular muscles or the thoracic spine. With the shoulder, most of the time we tend to focus just on the shoulder. Most important thing is the holistically, the biomechanical chain of the scapula and the thoracic spine gives the mobility to the shoulder complex. So we should not miss the scapular thoracic strengthening or periscapular strengthening. Uh, this for serratus anterior, it's a dynamic hug. It's like hugging with the therabands hold, like a dynamic hug. So diagonal movements is also happening and you're just trying to do the internal rotation. It's considered the best exercise to for strengthening of the serratus anterior. Now in this image, you can see that the person is trying to do the push-up plus exercises at three different rotations. The first image shows it's a neutral rotation. 
second shows it's an internally rotated shoulder and then you're trying to do the push up plus and with the third image it's an external rotation i've given the reference below among these three images the best one is push up plus with external rotation the last move the last figure with the external rotation there is maximum recruitment of serratus anterior fibers so whenever our goal is more to improve the serratus muscle we should focus on the rotation component also of the shoulder joint so um you've listened to each specific exercises of all the shoulder muscles so now the question arises which what should be the line of treatment whether we should just isolately strengthen in it or we should complexly strengthen it uh, there's a study in this 2004 the reference which have quoted according to this study it's like question questioning between okc or ckc most of the time in open kinematic chain we tend to focus on a specific muscle while in close kinematic chain which tend to focus on the agonist and the antagonist the con co contractions tend to happen so with whenever you getting confused between isolated or complex or okc versus ckc the correct answer is definitely complex and ckc so because a person don't have to do a specific action all through the day he don't have to do internal rotation or external rotation just in his daily routine he has to do his complex movements he has to do his activity of daily living and if there's an athlete he has to play his game he has to win his game rather so whenever the goals are complete or holistic how can the movements or rehab be just isolated so you should begin your rehab with the isolated action and then maybe you can shift to the complex action but you should not just we know of the patient with the isolated strengthening and then just send him home the complex movement training is also important and for that complex movement training the perfect example is push ups with this it's a close kinematic as well as it's a complex training so the benefits of both the things happen hand in hand uh, this image just shows that there are whole lots of variations i've just got nine but there are more than 100 variations of a push up so it it is divided into beginner intermediate and advanced you can see knee push up incline push up then with intermediate decline push up knuckle push up which is quite important in many of the sporting activities and this advanced you go up to close grip push ups clap push ups mm -hmm. okay so there are whole lots of variations and we have to see what is required in our patient now with the scapular rehab i'm just uh, giving you the insight of all the exercises that are available you can do it against the wall with the theraband tied and you're just doing the isometric contraction and trying to move your scapulas as well and you can do the scapular clock at 9 o'clock your fingers are placed at 9 o'clock position and you're just trying to protract and retract your shoulder or your scapula rather to give better contractions co contractions of your muscles and then next level you can go up to a gym ball and in which you're adding the component of unstable surface and improving upon the proprioception and kinesthesia as well and just trying to do all the shoulder movements which i have explained about the respective muscles on the gym ball so shoulder proprioception i believe it's most of the time a missed part whenever we do do our shoulder rehab we tend to miss our shoulder proprioception why because it's a non weight bearing joint most of the time whenever we do a rehab for ankle joint or a knee joint we remember ha balance board pe bhi karana hai balance training bhi karani hai tandem work bhi karani hai but with the shoulder it is often missed so we should not miss shoulder proprioception because proprioception for any and every joint has its own importance just giving you few exercises of shoulder proprioception as well with the initial phase you're just sitting you're just lying side lying with towel placed and doing an isometric contraction then you go up to sitting position and place your hand and do the isometric contraction of your shoulder muscles and similarly with your when you are standing and doing an isometric contraction on your hand 
as in you're trying to press your hand in this way. Then the intermediate phase, we are increasing the progressions with the intermediate phase. You go up to cat and camel position and just trying to do scapular protractions and retractions with this position. Then similar thing is performed against the wall. And your third, you can do just roll the ball forward and backward with your hands and weights over it with the single hand or with the double hand because you're just trying to progress further. With the advanced proprioceptive exercises, the side planks, it's, it's probably the hardest of all and it inculcates your proprioception as well as your strengthening happens. And then you can place the two unstable balls and place a hand over it and just try to do that. And you can place a single ball to decrease the progression. So according to this uh, level, the person, the patient is ach achieving, we can progress further. Then one hand up, the superman position. And when you are trying to do with the uh, normal push-up position, you're placing your hand on a kind of unstable surface. It's like a wobble board, a foamy bowl. And you're placing your hand over that. And it improves the kinesthesia and proprioception of your shoulder. And in this last image, they made a plus sign on a wall. And the patient is closing his eyes and just try to touch the center. So the visual feedback has been stopped and then the main focus in your is in on your upper limb or shoulder proprioceptions. These are some more scapulothoracic exercises. You're just trying to do the corner row with the W position, T position and Y position in the prone. And they are more, more focusing on the posterior scapular muscles and trying to strengthen them. Then with the L hold, there are scapular push-ups and scapular wall hold. You're just doing the isometric contraction and further progression is a cobra exercise. You're just trying to do extension, anti-gravity in prone position. So I forgot to post on Facebook, I was going to gym. Now this whole workout was a waste. Most of the time we are just trying to post things on Facebook but we should not be focusing on that and we should be providing the best possible rehab and our focus should be on the benefit of the patient. Another important thing with the shoulder joint is we should not miss the thoracic mobility because it's directly related. If there's a poor thoracic mobility, your rib cage is affected and then because the scapula lies just the adjacent to the rib cage, the scapular mobility is also affected. So as you can see in this image, there are two simple thoracic mobility exercises to stretching. They're playing a foam roll and just try to roll over that foam roll. So we should never miss the thoracic mobility because it's very much interlinked. They go hand in hand. Further, uh, on, in the final phase of rehab, you have to add on the plyometric. The speed part, the power part is very important. So we need to add the plyometric actions for the rotator cuff and the for scapular training. Two simple examples of is like nine, prone 90-90 plyometric exercises and just trying to throw the ball down and lift it up again. So plyometric should not be missed as with Proprioception and plyometric two P's are very important in any and every rehab. So to judge whether we have been successful or not. rehab karaya patient ka Now how to know how to know whether we have been successful or not. So there was a study by Tanaka et al. and they found four factors that appear to correlate well with the successful outcomes. So it's like if you are able to preserve the range of motion in external rotation with more than 52 degrees, the impingement signs are negative. There is little or no atrophy of a supraspinatus muscle and there's a preserved intramuscular tendon of supraspinatus. So if these four things, you tick mark on all these four things, then you have been able to propagate a good treatment, a good physiotherapy rehab 
to the patient and you've been successful. Uh, can I request Dr. Shal to uh, start a video, please? Uh, I think here I like to end. So if you've got any questions, you can just email me or maybe ask me here as well. Thank you for being a patient listener. And uh, at the end, I would just like to end with this last note. It says running is bad for my knees. Thank you, ma'am, for being... Yeah, but not running is bad for everything else. So we should really prioritize that whether we should do it or not do it. And that judgment can be taken by a good rehab professional, whether which exercises we should add on and which we should not. So we should prioritize and depending on that, we should give a best treatment possible. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the amazing session, ma'am. And uh, we have some very interesting questions which have been posted uh, on chat by our audiences. So taking one question at a time, uh, there's a question uh, from Anuradha Arora. It asks you that is 1990 hold an exercise which can be classified under empty can exercise? 1990 as in you're trying to when the empty can exercise is like when you are externally rotating your shoulder, it's like prone full can. And when you are internally rotated, it's empty can. So this, what 90-90 means is you're doing your 90 degree of abduction and 90 degree of rotation, rotation. then it's an empty can if it's internally rotated. Uh, Simran Bulati is asking, ma'am, what can be the immediate treatment for frozen shoulder? What I can uh, take from this question is probably she wants to know what could be the initial treatment a physiotherapist can give a frozen shoulder patient. And with the frozen shoulder, as we all know, the range of motion is restricted. So we have to provide with the mobilization definitely first. We should improve the range. But one thing which we tend to miss is that with the improvement of range, we don't strengthen the improved range. So we should improve the range and we should strengthen the new range as well. So the both goals go together. They are intertwined kind. The range is improved by mobilizations and stretchings and strengthening goes hand in hand. And because a frozen shoulder is a painful condition, so most of the time isometric strengthening works well for them. Okay, ma'am. Uh, there's a question from Amar Ali. He wants to know that how does winging of scapula affect shoulder range of motion? Well, winging of scapula is scapulothoracic mobility is affected. Yeah, that clearly says your serratus anterior and your trapezius components are weak. So definitely it will lead to painful or unstable shoulder. So we need to focus on strengthening of our serratus anterior muscle in that. Uh, so, ma'am, Simran wants to know if the treatment uh, for shoulder impingement would remain same. For the treatment of shoulder impingement, the first goal is pain relief. So, we have to go to our passive modalities. We need to use them, anti-inflammatory modalities, to reduce the pain. And definitely, the impingement, it depends. It is the root cause. If there's an acromial, hooked acromion, which is leading to impingement, then probably we need to go to Dr. Ashish. He's the best judge then. And if there's a bursitis, then also he can give some corticosteroid in the intermuscular region. And then from there, we can take over. But we need to know the root cause first of the impingement, and then further we can take it. So getting it right is what I said is very important. We knew we should get it right first. Then only we can take it further. Right, ma'am. Thank you so much for your time. And definitely this was an amazing session. We would end our session with one last question, which is for Dr. Ashish. So one of our uh, attendees want to know what is index dislocation? 
index dislocation is the first dislocation that happens to the patient. That is called the index dislocation, whether it is associated with the trauma or whether it is not associated with the trauma. Where it, even if it is a trauma, whether it is a dis, uh, significant trauma or not, that has to be very much uh, properly elicited from the patient that how the injury has happened, whether it is a significant fall or it is just a stretch and the uh, shoulder was dislocated or subluxated, has he been to the hospital to relocate it or it was relocated on its own. Those things gives us, uh, gives us an idea regarding how much uh, uh, injury was there and whether the patient has any laxity or it is a significant trauma leading to the labrum tear and dislocation. So the further management depends on basically the index dislocation. So any case of dislocation should be queried for how the first time your shoulder was dislocated, how much injury and how. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ashish, Dr. Kanika, who have uh, definitely uh, given a very clear idea about today's topic. Uh, in this glorious moment, I would extend my warm wishes again to both of our resource persons and heartfelt gratitude to the Central Delhi District IAP team and India IAP team, especially Dr. Sanjeev Jha, President IAP, because of whom we have got this Zoom platform. Dr. Suresh Babu Reddy, Vice President IAP, Dr. K. N. Annamalai, General Secretary IAP, Dr. Ruchi Vashne, Treasurer IAP, Dr. Joji John, CC IAP, Dr. Pooja Sethi, President DIAP, Dr. Zubi Vakar, General Secretary DIAP, Dr. Jyoti Bala, EC Member DIAP, Dr. Shail Sachdeva, Treasurer DIAP, Dr. Gaurav Gupta, Executive Member DIAP, Dr. Abhay Singhal, Executive Member DIAP, Dr. Amit Kumar, convener DIAP, Dr. Amit Goel, secretary DIAP, and last but not the least, technical team ably supported by Dr. Uttara and Dr. Vinod Kaushik. Without uh, this wonderful team, I'm very sure this webinar would not have been possible. Wishing all the good day, wishing everybody a very, very safe year ahead and leaving with a request to our wonderful IAP team to keep organizing such uh, wonderful webinars and a request to all our attendees, keep your mask on and keep washing your hands and maintain social distance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much for the organizing team to invite me on in this August gathering. Thank you so much.